Hello and welcome to the Arrow 499 Section 2 Spring 2015 Final Project. For this year, our project was to design and develop an autonomous system capable of demonstrating low-cost guidance, navigation, and control system technologies in a GPS-denied environment. As you can see below, this is a picture of the final design that we produced. Our requirements were as follows. For data processing, we were only allowed to use a programmable system on chip from Cypress. We were allowed to use a ground control station, but it could only be used for initialization and shutdown. It was not allowed to be used for operating the loop command during demonstration. We had to use provided Herculex servos, with which we were given two, as well as a provided LiDAR sensor. Additional servos and sensors were allowed to be used, but they must fall within the budget mentioned below. For the demonstration, the system had to remain within a 10 by 10 foot square and must avoid cone obstacles within that square, and they must start and end at designated areas. Overall, the system cost was not allowed to exceed $150 out of pocket, as well as $150 in provided materials. On our demonstration day, the following deliverables were required. The compliant system, also known as the robot that we've built, a demonstration of the robot capability within the square previously mentioned, system documentation, which includes architecture, interface control documents, cost records, and a requirements compliance matrix, a system video, which is what you're watching now, and peer evaluations. The team was separated into four subsystems. The systems team consists of myself, as well as my colleague, Matthew Praginata. The electronics team was led by Sean Conda, software by Sean Matthews, and structures by Reginald Guinto. As each team lead introduces their subsystems, they will also introduce you to the colleagues with which they worked to overcome the challenges to create the robot that you've seen in the second slide. From a systems perspective, we began with the classic V seen in systems engineering. We started with a concept of operations definition. We then broke into system level requirements and broke those down to component level requirements. Once those were known, we acquired those components, integrated them, and then test and verified to make sure that everything worked properly, leading up to the demo day that we have now. Next, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Matthew Praginata, who's gonna talk about schedule, concept of operations, and system architecture. Hello, this is Matthew Prajanata. I'm one of the system engineer of the project. I'll start with the schedule breakdowns of the project. We were given a total of 30 days to complete the mission, with the most significant part was spent in developing the system architecture and troubleshooting the code logic of the system. Next is the conops of the project. The arena used is a square with area of 3.048 meter by 3.08 for eight meter. There will be 12 cones acting as obstacle spread randomly on the arena. The objective of the project is transport the robot from the starting area to finish line without hitting the cones. More in-depth explanation will be given by the software group. In our design process, we had several iterations on the base platform before we decide on the current design. We chose Rectangle Base as our main platform due to its simplicity and ease of manufacturing. To comply with the financial requirements, we optimized the system to be op as affordable as possible and still achieve the objective. The result is the robot with the acquisition cost of $88.19, less than a third of the total allocated budget. Next, we have the total project block diagram first the system block diagram we organize the project into three levels the system subsystem and component the subsystem is categorized into three they are electronic structures and software its subsystem have their own respective component such as PSOC, lidar and the servo here is the main architecture block diagram. Each components are connected with a specified interface and they are color coded for ease of troubleshooting and verification. We are also have an ICD file to make sure each sub leads know how the subsystem interface with each other. 
We will now move on to the subsystem explanation beginning with the electronic subsystem. The electronics team and today we're going to be going over the computer processing system which involves the PSOC, the component specifications for the LiDAR and the servo, a trade study on the different power supplies we had in mind uh, along with the voltage regulators, also the system interactions which include the schematic and the prototyping of the initial system, following that a circuit layout, wiring, and finally recommendations. So here is my team. We have Stephen Liu in charge of system prototyping, Han Nguyen, voltage regulator trade study, Andrew Cho, recommendations, Justin Ellerby, power supply trade study, Nate Brown, circuit layout, Andrew Chandler, Chandler system specifications, and Andrea Valdez, architecture block diagram. Hi, my name is Andrew Chandler, and I will be briefly explaining the computer processing system and the sensor and actuator specifications for the vehicle. For the computer processing system, the programmable system on a chip, or PSOC, from Cypress Semiconductors was used. The PSOC was configured for serial communication between the PSOC and the actuator and between the PSOC and the sensor. For the vehicle, two actuators were used to provide rolling movement for the vehicle. The actuator used was the Herculex DRS0101 Smart Servo. The communication between the servo and the PSOC was done via UART serial communication. The servo's input voltage has a range of 7 to 12 volts direct current, abbreviated as VDC. However, this optimized input voltage for the servo is 7.4 VDC. At this value, the current draw is about 450 milliamps for a torque of 1.7 kilograms of force per centimeter and 670 milliamps of 2.2 kilogram force per centimeter. The resolution of this servo, which is its smallest positional increment, is 0.325 degrees. There are two modes for this servo, position control mode and speed control mode. Speed control mode was used to provide the vehicle with controlled continuous rotation. The sensor used for obstacle avoidance was a LiDAR light sensor from Pulse Light. Communication was done between the LiDAR and the PSOC through an I2C serial communications interface. The LiDAR sensor has a nominal input voltage of 4.7 to 5.5 VDC. For this range, it draws only about 100 milliamps at its peak power when taking a distance measurement and uses about 10 milliamps when idle. The range of the LiDAR is 30 meters at 30% of its target and 40 meters at 90% of its target. It has an acquisition time of less than 20 milliseconds and an accuracy of plus or minus 0 0.025 meters. Hi, I'm Justin. I'm going to go over a power trade study that we did in order to determine what power supply to use. So for starters, we opted to have two different batteries. Um, in this case, we decided to go with three cell LiPos that operate at 11.1 .1 volts to about 12.6. And in this case, we would have to regulate the voltage that the PSOC and the LiDAR sees as well as the two servos. So the PSOC and the LiDAR need five volts each. Therefore, we'd have to have some resistance up front that would drop the voltage down. And over here, we need 7.4 volts. So it's the same thing. The problem with uh, this setup is that the current is not necessarily going to be the same. So this resistor is constant which means that as current changes, this voltage drop is going to be same, so this is not always going to be seen 5 volts or 7.4. So we opted to have this voltage regulator in here, where if this exceeds 5 volts, this is going to be seen as an open circuit. The problem with this is reliability. We weren't really sure how stable this was going to be. So the other option was to do a similar circuit with 12.6 volts here and then have a voltage regulator so that the PSOC and the LiDAR would both see 5 volts at all times. Kind of like that. And then over here for this one, we could actually use a two cell battery, which 
if you add that up, um, those see about 7.4 volts output. So we actually would not need anything in between the two servos because those both want that 7.4 volts. Um, so the thing with this is we have two batteries, which is just taking up space. And um, the concern was kind of current draw. And after doing some research, we found that with a three cell of 12.6, our battery actually has a 20C discharge rate, meaning that it can output up to 44 amps. And um, so it can output 44 amps. And we're seeing about 120 from the PSOC and the LiDAR. And we did some tests to see how much the servos were gonna take. And it's about 500 milliamps total. So a total of 620 milliamps which means that we can run this thing for about three and a half hours. So current is not an issue in how long we can run it or how much we're gonna need. So we have another system or circuit where we only have one battery and two different voltage regulators. So we're gonna have a five, five volt voltage regulator and then a 7.4 volt voltage regulator over here, and then the PSOC and the LiDAR, both taking five volts, and you don't need anything else in here. And then these guys, so this guy's about 20 milliamps, and this thing, LiDAR, was running at 100 milliamps tops, whereas over here we have servo one, and servo two, both together pulling 500 milliamps. So we're well within what our battery is capable of doing with this setup, and we have all of this, um, all these components already. We have the 7.4 volt regulator and the 5 volt regulator. These are actually variable, so we can set these to whatever we want. So instead of 7.4, if we need 7 volts, or instead of 5 volts, we want 4.5 volts, we can do that. So we opted to go with this circuit for our um, obstacle avoidance vehicle. Oh, hello there. My name is Han. Today I'm going to be talking to you about a trace study we did on voltage regulator. So we look at several different voltage regulators in order to control the voltage going into our LiDAR and Herculex servo. We need to use voltage, uh, voltage regulators because the LiDAR and, ser and the servo require different amount of voltage. The LiDAR require about 5 volt and the servo require 7.4 volt to power. These components work on a range of voltage, but it is easier to optimize the function and movement of our LiDAR and servo if, if the voltage is constant. A voltage regulator is designed to automatically maintain a constant voltage level. A voltage regulator may be a simple feed-forward design or may include negative feedback control loops. It may, it may use an electro, uh, electromechanical mechanism or electronic components. So look at the voltage like so we looked at several voltage regulator for our circuit. Initially, we wanted to build one out of resistor and capacitor. We also look at these inexpensive voltage regulator that have an adjustable set value that we can adjust the value of it. They cost about 195. However, these require us to build a small circuit and we have to calculate the resistor value that we need for it because once we set the value, we can't change it anymore on these. So there's a little bit of a trade-off with these. So we also look at these, adjust, these, type, these second type of voltage regulator later. These have a potential ometer, as you can see here, the screw, and we can turn it to set the voltage, uh, the output voltage on it. So after getting a little bit of advice from a system guy, we decided to buy a couple of these because we don't have to calculate the voltage regulator for it. And then we just turn a screw to get the voltage that we want. As you can see here, we can turn the screw right here 
to get the voltage that we want. And it also has, has a display to tell us the kind of voltage that we have. So it makes things much easier for our guys. Hello, my name is Andrea Valdez and I'll be going over the electrical architecture block diagram and the circuit configuration that we chose. For the electrical system of the obstacle avoidance robot, the power management system consists of a three cell 12.6 volt battery and two voltage regulators maintaining 5 volts and 7.4 volts. The voltage regulators were configured in series to prevent varying voltage fluctuations by the different current draws. The hardware subsystem the hardware subsystem consists of the PSOC programmable chip at 5 volts and then for the motor subsystem we have two 7.4 volt servos, Herculex servos in parallel. And then lastly for the sensor subsystem we use the pulse light lidar with an optimum voltage of about 5 volts. The three cell battery provides 12.6 volts which is connected to the voltage regulator which steps down the 7.4 volts. From there the leads feed into the breadboard where it powers the servos. The servos are daisy chained together which simplify the wiring because they have their own input. They're still able to receive two isolated commands. The servos are connected by the transmitter and receiver pins into the PSOC chip. Now going back to the 7.4 volt rail, the voltage is stepped down by the 5 volt reg voltage regulator and this powers the PSOC and the LiDAR at 5 volts. The LiDAR also has its own receiver and transmitter pins. And this completes how the components are connected together. Hi, I'm Nathan Brown, and I'm going to be talking about wiring for all of our electrical components. So first, we decided to use a solderless breadboard with 30 terminal strips on it to have signal routing for our PSOC. Now, our PSOC has 22 header pins on each side, so 30 terminal strips is ideal. Also, for our extra terminal strips at the end, we can put in a toggle switch to be able to turn on and off our system. Um, this breadboard also has two power buses on each side. One of the power buses will be used for 7.4 volts and then the other one will be down at 5 volts. The 7.4 volt power bus will be powering our servos and the 5 volt power bus will be used for our PSOC as well as our LiDAR. Now to power this we have our three cell battery as we said before. Uh, the end connection type is a Dean's plug and it's a female end so we needed to have a male end for our Dean's plug and we soldered some wires onto that. Now these soldered wires will go directly into the end of our voltage regulator and then that will lower our voltage down to the proper 7.4 volts. I'm Steven and I'm going to be covering the prototyping that we did for the system. So we had two options. We, as talked about before, we have a ser uh, one set up in series and one set up in parallel and we had to go through both of these both in theory and by testing it to see how consistent the two prototyping architectures were so the considerations we had to take in making the system are as follows we had to go through we had to have a minimum of 7.0 volts for the servos and we had the lidar operating at 4.7 minimum and a required 5.0 volt for the PSOC. Now, the first architecture is the architecture in parallel as seen here. The parallel configuration has a couple of benefits because we had economy of space. We were able to put everything on a single level. But as we continued through this through the development, we also were able to find that it also takes 25% less wire and connections to make the whole system work. And the cost of this was that the powering was inconsistent for the LiDAR and the draw from the power system because the two voltage dividers that or two voltage regulators that were used they would push current over from one side to the other and then at times you wouldn't get adequate voltage and current draw for the LiDAR 
so it would get kind of spotty. Now, the other architecture is what we actually went with. This is the uh, setup in series. As you can see, we have the battery going to voltage regulator one, then down to voltage regulator two that powers the PSOC and the LiDAR. With this, we had adequate uh, power throughout the whole system and it wasn't spotty or inconsistent. Uh, the only cost to this was it takes more wiring and we also had to add the second deck so that we can have enough room to move all the wires around and allow all the relays to happen. Now, in the next slide, we're gonna be showing the actual setup that we had. Uh, it doesn't, it's not with the two levels, but as you can see, we have the uh, voltage regulators and we are going to be using those with conjunction in the PSOC and the, light, and the LiDAR. Now, for the conclusion, um, we showed that we're showing both our image of our test of our wired test and our uh, break and our uh, diagram. So we went with architectural architecture two. Operational requirements weren't risked, so we went with this architecture. And uh, we also had structures delegate more surface area by adding the second deck. Hi, my name is Andrew Cho, and today I'll be talking about the recommendations we came up with for improvements for any future projects dealing with obstacle avoidance vehicle. Our first recommendation is that if we had more time, we could have designed our own printed circuit board. The voltage regulators along with all the wiring connections could then all be held in the circuit print, printed circuit board. This would help us save space on the vehicle and also cost us buying a separate voltage regulators. Also, if we had more time, we could have designed our own power supply so that we, could, we would be more power efficient. Putting multiple batteries in series would allow us to get the power required for each specific component. Doing a trade study would also be required though to see whether using the voltage regulators or designing a printed circuit board would be more cost and time efficient. Also, soldering the components to each other would be recommended since it would allow, it would allow you to check continuity between each component and also troubleshoot efficiently versus using a breadboard to house all the wires and PSOC. Another design idea that can be implemented in the future project is placing the solar sensor on the bottom deck of the vehicle and raising the lighter sensor to the upper deck of the vehicle. This would allow for redundancy and the vehicle would be more aware of the obstacles as by the increase in sensor integration capabilities. So in summary, we started a process by first performing trade studies to find the simplest and most efficient solutions to connect the given components together such as the LiDAR, the two servos, and the PSOC. The first trade study, trade study required was the one conducted on the power supply. From this trade study, it was found that the best power source to power all the components was a three-cell battery capable of producing 12.6 volts. Next, by using two voltage regulators in series, the voltage could be stepped down to 7.4 volts and power the two Herculex servos, and then be further reduced to five volts by a secondary voltage regulator in order to power the PSOC and the LiDAR at their optimum power levels. Using these adjustable voltage regulators, we were able to further simplify the circuit required. Finally, using a breadboard, we were able to house all the various power and ground, ground wires from the servos, LiDAR, and voltage regulators, along with the PSOC, and allow for easy connections without having to solder all the components together. Hi there. My name is Sean Matthews. I am the team lead for the software team for the obstacle avoidance robot uh, for Aero 499. Our team consists of T, or Sahara Tifung, Ju Justin Gray, Roger, Adam Ortega, Taylor Sano, and Justin Ryu. The order of our video will begin with Roger and the flow diagram showing the thoughts that our robot has at each individual step. Next, it will be Adam, Justin, and T going over the robot capabilities, showing a little bit of some of our functions. Next, we'll have our actuators uh, presented by Taylor, LiDAR presented by me, and testing and code presented by me and Justin.
Hello, this is Justin Gray, and I will be going over the avoidance functions. They were categorized into primary and secondary functions. Within the primary functions, we have the waggle check and the turn, which has a subfunction of reverse. And in the secondary function, we have position tracking. However, due to time constraints, we were unable to achieve this. However, we'll still go over the idea we had. For the waggle check, our reasons for doing this were to ensure the LiDAR does not misread a cone and to just check the surrounding area to prevent the robot from trying to maneuver in between two close cones. And I will show diagrams of this on the next slide. The application of the waggle check is that it will perform the waggle check before every forward maneuver. And if it's unable to move forward, it'll execute a turn and the choice of direction for the turn is determined um, by the surrounding cones, and that'll be uh, taken in more in depth later on in the presentation. So the first scenario that we deemed uh, a probable uh, issue is here, where the cone is in front of the robot and the lidar misses the cone barely so it registers as nothing being in front of it however if it were to proceed forward it would hit the cone the second scenario was with two cones and the lidar reading nothing in between however if it were to move forward it would proceed to hit both cones this is the reason why we implemented the waggle check which allows the the robot to kind of sway back and forth just to do a sweep of the the area in front of it for the turn maneuver the reasons we added this was to obviously move around obstacles or cones for the application it essentially performs a 90 degree turn and when it does that it'll check to make sure the path is clear move forward and then it'll do another 90 degree uh, to return back to its original heading and then it'll perform the waggle check if the path's not clear this is where the reverse function comes in and the robot will reverse out of the area and find a new path to take. For position tracking, the reasons we wanted to implement this, however we couldn't, was to track where the robot is relative to the boundaries we were given, and this would ensure the robot doesn't go out of bounds. The application for this would basically be, we'd have a start location hard-coded into the program, and it would track the robot based on of based on its forward and horizontal movements and this determines whether the turn maneuver is left or right which I'll explain in the next slide if this is our boundary we decided to split it up into segments where the middle segment that is highlighted in blue would be where the robot would want to go to while it's moving forward so if the robot was in the left quadrant, it would want to move. If it were to avoid, it would move towards the center, and it, uh, which is to the right. And if it was in the right quadrant, it would do the same thing. However, to the left. Hello, this is Adam speaking. Now that we've went over the logic of the waggle check, we'll be going into some different scenarios that our model might encounter. Here, you can see case one just a single cone in front of the model. It would detect that there's something in front of it and in which case it would either turn left or right. So for this instance, it'll be rotating right, does a check, sees that it's clear, it'll go forward, reorientate itself, and do another check, sees that nothing's there, and can continue to go forward. Next, we'll look at case two. So just like in case one, there will be a single cone in front of it. However, this time, there is a cone in front of it when it rotates to the right. It's going to see this cone, and it will rotate back to its original position. We decided to go backwards instead of rotating left to see if the class path is clear because if it were to swing left it could potentially hit the cone on the right. So as it goes backwards it does another reading 
However, this time the readings are farther, in which case it will either go left or right, depending on what it picks up. Finally, we'll look at case three. Now, here we have our model sort of stuck. Uh, this could happen. Um, it's very unlikely, but it could happen in case these cones uh, were not picked up from the blind spots of the model. So in this case, the LiDAR would read and see that there's it's trapped in between these cones. In this case, it would just do a backwards movement and do another reading. Again, it will be further than the original reading, and in that case, it will do the waggle check and you on. So now we'll be talking about the distance traveled. We mentioned that there was a counter earlier and this counter uh, serves as our tracker for distance. So initially we set the counter to zero and each time the model does a forward or backward movement the counter is passed through. It'll either increase or decrease depending on the movement. And we <clears throat> mentioned earlier that each forward movement or backward movement is about three seconds, which is equivalent to eight inches. So that gives us a total of 16 counts. And here is an example of how the count works. So we'll start at zero with the model as the model moves to the right, nothing is passed through. But as soon as it moves forward, it passes through that the count is 1. And this continues all the way throughout the 10 feet. This is uh, to keep track of our boundaries in the test area. All right, hello, everyone. Um, this is t um, Zahra. I'll be covering the waggle check function. The function will only be taking an argument um, of the current counter, which will be an int. Um, the function will run, basically it will do a check, it will update the values, it will then match it to the appropriate case, and then it will execute and return the um, new and updated uh, counter value um, for the check. The robot will be turning to five different angles um, in increments of 20 degrees up to 40 degrees to the left and to the right. And as you can see, it'll be it's um, the way we labeled our, or recorded our angles is actually 21543. Starting from the left, the LiDAR reading function is executed at each angle. The reading, um, the distance reading is then compared to um, the range that we have set for it. Um, we set a longer range for the forward um, angle to be 40 centimeters and every other angle would be 35 centimeters. As for the update, um, for each angle um, in our code, in the C code, it is represented by a boolean variable. So if it detects a object within the range, it will then um, set the variable to be true and false otherwise. Um, then it will match and execute the appropriate um, action based on the um, values recorded for the angle. Um, the robot will then execute the command within the statement and return um, the value of the current counter either incremented or decremented. Um, back to the main function that and then the global um, counter will be updated there. Um, here I have the waggle check function kind of a breakdown of what is going to happen for a um, particular case. Here we have um, three cones randomly set uh, and as you can see the robot will then check and update will be going through each of the angles. And af 
after that, um, the boolean values should be as shown on the table. And then we move on to the um, match case. So seeing that there is no object in angles 1, 5, or 4, the robot will then execute um, the if else statement to be uh, moved forward. And then after that, it will return the current counter. And with a, uh, the move forward moves for about um, 3 milliseconds, which is equivalent to about 8 inches. Two actuators were used for this project, the Herculex DRS-0101. These servos have both position control from 0 to 320 degrees, as well as continuous speed control with the user input speed. These servos draw about 450 milliamps at 7.4 volts and use UART serial communication rather than pulse width modulation as most servos use. The four pins shown in the middle diagram represent in order ground, power supply pin, transmit, and receive data pins. Each servo has two sets of these four pins which allow for daisy chaining these servos. Daisy chaining is when you connect several devices together in a linear series and for these servos it allows for an easy way to both power and control servos without the need of extra wiring to the PSOC. Out of the box, each servo has the same servo ID, 0x, FD, and hex by default which needs to be changed in order to control each servo independently. This is important because it allows you to move each servo in opposite directions which is needed for turning. Using the pre-written servo set ID, we changed one of the servos to have an ID of 0xfc in hex. Below is an example of the function that writes the new ID to the servo. Servo initializes, zeroes the servo and prepares it to receive commands, while servo set ID assigns it a new integer value. Here are a couple of examples of our control functions that were used to move the robot. Move forward and veer right. These functions first define the, fir the servo to control, 0xfc for the left servo and 0xfd from for the right servo. These servos are controlled independently and therefore need to be called separately. Servo action all delays the commands by one second in order to give the robot time to execute the move commands. For convenience, we also assign different color LEDs to each function in order to visually see what motion is being executed. In this case, move forward is green and veer right is blue. Move backward and veer left were also functions we use, but the code was left out because the only differences were the assigned speed values. For example, to move backwards, you simply switch the signs of the speed values in the move forward function and so on for the other functions. The turn right function requires a little more logic and communication with the LiDAR to determine obstacle position. Essentially, if the LiDAR detects something is in its path, the robot will attempt to go around it. If nothing is detected, the robot continues to move forward. I will now be discussing the LiDAR. We are using a LiDAR light laser module. This is produced by Pulsed Light 3D. A brief summary of the LiDAR. It is a class one laser. It has a range from zero to 40 meters. It is relatively small, as you can see with the dimensions here. Good range, high accuracy, low voltage. And to communicate, we are using the I2C interface. For the LiDAR, we have a C file and a header file. These are mainly for communication from the LiDAR to the PSOC. However, the communication was a little beyond uh, the student's capability or the understanding of the programs, so we did need assistance from our professor, Wes Gates, and uh, his help, Matt Gann, as well as Jordan. The C file for the LiDAR light consists of a write LiDAR, and a read from LiDAR. These both pass in three parameters, uh, the first being the LiDAR address, which is zero or a hex file, 0x62. The LiDAR register, what we want uh, to know the value from, and a data buff. We added our own functions called LiDAR reading, which takes a distance and populates an array uh, which is then returned through a uint16 distance. Uh, for testing purposes, we wanted to output to putty. And so here we have putty, we have distance populate putty, and uh, this is then outputted through the terminal. Now to dig into the code a little bit, our code begins with I2C start, which is for the LiDAR, and servo initialize. What servo initialize does is it reboots the servo, 
and then it changes uh, both actuators to their original position, which is zero degrees. Since we are daisy chained, this would then command both servos to be set to that. However, in the initialize statement, it also has a UART, so it starts the UART or the communication with the PSOC. Our servos tended to air quite a bit, and we would encounter red flashing lights, and the servos would spin uncontrollably that had uh, no reference to our software. So we created our own function called uh, software update or servo update. And what this is, it's nearly identical to initialize, but instead of setting the servos back to zero, uh, it just doesn't do anything. So it just reboots the servos. Uh, what this would do is it would, it would remove all the errors and proceed with the next function. Some additional functions we need to create are move forward, move backward, veer right and left, check right and left, waggle check, turn right and left, and servo stop. In our C function, our move forward simply commands each individual servo to move at a set speed. Uh, as you can see, our FD, or our right servo, needs to be slightly faster than our left due to an error in the placement of the left servo. So to compensate, our right servo needs to spin slightly faster. Move backward is the same. Veer right, uh, obviously to turn right, our actuators will have to actually spin the same direction or clockwise or counterclockwise. Uh, which in turn will move the robot itself either clockwise or counterclockwise. Our turn right and our turn left functions uh, start with a veer right or veer left. It then stops the servo and takes a distance reading. And if that distance reading is less than 20, it'll return to its original position and move backward and then proceed to turn right or left again and follow the steps. If it is a, if there is no cone or any uh, obstacle in its way after veering or turning directly to its right, it will then move forward, stop the servo and servo update to eliminate errors if, if there are any, and veer back left. These CY delay statements are placed strategically so our robot will end up directly facing the end zone. As the, as the others have already gone in depth in, is the waggle check. Uh, there is a lot of logic that had to be passed through if, else, if, else, else, if. So I won't go into too much. However, we are taking five readings, angle one, angle two, angle three, angle four, angle five. Through each of these five angles, they are going to be set to either true or false. Uh, once this is done, the logic will be used to determine what it does. Uh, which direction it goes, and how far it will go. However, all these servo updates are due to the amount of errors we encounter with our actuators. So uh, there have been very glitchy turns that may reorient us, and at that point, our robot is pretty much unretrievable. Um, these servo updates, however, eliminate as much errors as possible, but there are still uh, some glitches that are unable to be fixed. I will now be talking about the testing phase of the model, showing you each of the functions mentioned previously in action. During the testing phase, there was a lot of trial and error involved. The first and main function that will be shown is the waggle check to move forward function. The slight errors we came across during this phase was that during the waggle, there will be a slight deviation that had to be addressed due to the swivel wheel causing an unaccounted random force. Also, due to the slight bend in the wheels, the model would often veer one way. This was addressed by giving different speeds to each servo, which was done by trial and error. The next function is a turn function. When faced with a cone in the front or another obstructing object, the model was coded to either turn left or right at random to a 90 degree angle move forward, then turn 90 degrees back to its original uh, direction and continue its first function at a new location. The trial and error step in this process was in trying to adjust the rotational degree to an accurate 90 degrees. 
Now, another function that is shown is in the case that the random turn direction has an obstru obstruction in its path. The LiDAR would read this object at 90 degrees, rotate back to its original position, and then backtrack a certain distance. It would then check again the same direction it turned before and repeat the steps until a clearing can be seen, in which case it would proceed to the cleared area, turn 90 degrees back to its original direction, and continue its first function. Upon completion of all its tasks, the last function inputted that can be seen is where the model would spin out for a certain duration. There were glitches in the servos, as well as misreadings from the LiDAR that caused the direction to be altered, which were unable to be addressed exactly. However, we concluded that outside of a major glitch, the model would complete its given task successfully. So now we'll be going into the structures portion of the 499 Section 2's project. Specifically, uh, this is the area in which we're creating the physical manifestation of the autonomous system meant to uh, go through the obstacle course. Um, so mainly, the structures portion dealt with the requirements of the 4.0 obstacle avoidance section. Uh, specifically, uh, sections 4.1 and 4.2, which were to give ample room um, in, within the boundaries given to us of the obstacle course. So we decided to make the buggy as compact as possible to be able to have a better turn radius around the course, as well as a smaller vehicle means less likelihood of hitting a target. Right, uh, and 4.2 was to make sure to ensure that the um, cones were not were completely avoided by the buggy. So the size of that had a lot. The size that we had designed to had a lot to do with that. Uh, the dimensions are shown here in the CAD model that Ben Myers had made for us. Uh, the next major issue that we had in the structured portion was following the requirement in 5.1, specifically the one that was meant for us to stay under the $150 budget. Um, we had to make a lot of concessions in this, specifically in terms of trying to keep as much money uh, available to be allocated to the other groups. In the end, we ended up going with the cheap MDF material for the base plate of the buggy as well as going with just the free wheels that were given to us at the start of the project, as opposed to getting the specific Herculex wheels that would have been directly compatible with the servos that we had, it, which would have actually been a lot more, a lot better for the project in terms of uh, fitting onto the servo and allowing for it to not have a little wiggle on it to be as stable as possible, which we'll be going over later in this video section. So when we were planning out the layout of our vehicle, we decided to use two levels instead of one um, to minimize the clutter and allow for easier uh, access to when we need to reprogram the piece off. Um, also in order for us to have everything easily removed and adjustable, we were planning to put Velcro all across the two boards uh, so that we can reposition stuff easier, or in case certain things get better in certain spots, uh, we can just easily pull on and put it back onto the board. Uh, and for motion, uh, we have two main wheels, uh, you can see here, with a caster wheel in the back that will allow uh, for the vehicle to have a better turning radius. Okay, so up front you see the LiDAR, and as we move around the vehicle, you can see uh, part of our main wheel. Um, you can also see our double-decker system, which allows us to fit more components in a more compact space. As we come around to the back of the vehicle, you can see the caster wheel, which allows us to have a better turn radius. And on the inside, there's nothing at the moment, but we're planning to layer this top and bottom layers with Velcro for easy access and work. As part of the structures assignment, a CAD model was required for the system. We decided to use SOLIDWORKS as our platform for modeling. To do this, measurements of each component were taken and were used to accurately design each model. The first task was to model the part that was mandatory to the design. These parts included the LiDAR and two servos. 
After modeling the LiDAR using SOLIDWORKS, the model of a, the servo was found online and used in our assembly. Next, the secondary parts were modeled. This included the smaller white wheels given to us at the beginning of the project and the PSOC. As the electronics team communicated which components they needed, we modeled them as well. The base plate and standoffs used to support the components were the last thing to be modeled. Here, you can see the voltage regulator, the PSOC, breadboard, and power source. After all these parts were modeled, the assembly was created and the final model can be seen here. So I'll be talking about the case study we did for one level base plate versus two level base plate. Uh, when we were working with the electronic team to design our structure, we had to make sure we had enough surface area to hold all our hardware required. Uh, our hardware is one LiDAR that will be mounted over here, and uh, two servos and two wheels, a caster wheel, a battery, a voltage regulator, a PSOC, and a breadboard. Uh, so our original plan was having one base plate. Uh, problem with that, we, we saw that we'll have a longer uh, plate, uh, and that will cause a problem when turning in uh, tighter areas because our model will have a uh, large turning radius. But then we decided to go with two levels. Uh, this helped us minimize uh, how big our model will be and uh, it would, didn't have any extra cost and it will fit all our hardware and have easy access using Valco. Okay, so uh, moving on to our, our wheel selection, we originally were given um, these wheels that we're currently using. However, uh, we did not see an easy way to mount them onto the servo, seeing as um, they weren't made for the Herculex servo and no servo arms were originally provided. So we did some research online and found some Herculex uh, brand wheels that were made specifically for the Herculex servos. However, uh, when we went to purchase them, it was gonna cost us about two-thirds of the entire budget um, just for shipping over here so that we would get them in time so uh, we took a step back and uh, we found these these servo arms that uh, could be made to fit with our servo however um, their interface was a little rough they didn't fit on exactly properly and uh, they didn't mount flushly with the wheels so um, after we had put them on we modified them slightly but it was warping the wheel, so the wheel wasn't turning um, properly. Um, after that, we found some uh, other servo arms, as you can see here, that uh, could be modified uh, and fit flush on the wheel to stop, uh, to prevent the warping problem, <clears throat> as well as uh, fit uh, better on the servo. A, a Dremel was used to Dremel out the inside um, to make it fit over the the servo uh, better and then uh, screws were screw holes were drilled into the servo arm and uh, then screws were then uh, used to attach the outside wheel to the the round servo arm um, which since it fits fit fleshly it didn't it didn't warp the wheel okay so originally the uh, lidar was going to be mounted on top and on a third servo however this proved too difficult because uh, the software team would have to program for the sweeping of the LiDAR and it's also too expensive to purchase another servo. So instead we decided to mount the LiDAR lower because uh, the electronics and software team wanted it to be as low as possible so we sense more of the cone and so that it is also the closest part of the cone that's to us. As you can see here, we are gluing the blocks to the base plate. and clamping them down so the glue can set. Oh wow. Here you can see that we're screwing in the LiDAR.
drive, wasn't it? Yeah. I can't. It, that one's one of the hard ones. Because that fucking fire war bear from like. Well, I have a water team. And that. And mounting it to the very front of the air, uh, vehicle. Now I gotta get a closer to Justin in case he does. We need a couple more shots of that. Yeah, do your managerial stuff. You wanna go hide in the corner? The next problem was how to mount the servos to the base plate. Initially, we thought we would be able to mount the servo with epoxy, but after contacting Professor Gates, it was agreed that the servo needed to be returned in the same condition that was given to us. This scraped the epoxy idea. We decided the best route to, was to go with double-sided tape. This would be mounted on the servo easily um, to the flat surface, then onto the base plate. Later in the design phase, we found out that only one zip tie will fit since the other one that goes across the servo would get in the way of the wheel. Here you can see the base plate being prepped for the servo mounting. The notches were being filed so that the zip tie would have a better fit. These holes were drilled on the sides of the mounting area for the zip, ho zip holes. Here is a double-sided tape being used to mount the servo to the base plate, and this is a finished pro product with both servos mounted to the vehicle. So, in conclusion, uh, the team was successful in assembling the structural design for the overall system. The main objective of the team was to supply the electronics team enough service area to hold all, all of their hardware, while also keeping the overall design functional. This included uh, applications and mounting of the supply components such as the LiDAR and the servo. We encountered our biggest obstacles during the mounting of the servo. Um, our original idea of using epoxy fell through due to the requirement of returning the servo in the same condition as when we received it. So we kind of toiled around a little bit um, with numerous methods of mounting the servo to the base plate. And as a team, we ultimately decided that the best way was to go with the double-sided tape and the zip tie. Uh, this was both cost efficient and effective since the materials had already been bought and um, we didn't have to add anything to our list of finances and also held the servo in place securely for the system design. At the beginning of the design phase, uh, the team was afraid that the other subsystems would take uh, a bit more time deciding on the required service area for their components uh, and this we thought this would leave us with little time to actually fabricate the system. But fortunately for us, uh, the other subsystems did a great job at communicating with us during the entire design phase, uh, what they needed and how they needed it. And that allowed us to produce a vehicle structure that was compatible throughout the entire design and done in a timely manner. I'm, 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 I'm,